Hey guys, welcome back. So in this video, we're going to be talking about a really cool method of integration. And chances are you have never learned this method, and you probably never will learn this method, even in school. But it's an incredibly useful method of integration, and it can be applied to some integrals um, in place of integration by parts. So I'm going to show you the basic idea behind it, and then we're going to work through a couple examples. So be sure to stick around, and then you can add this method into your arsenal of integration strategies. Okay, so what I have here is an arbitrary function that we're going to call f, and we're going to suppose that, that there exists an inverse of this function. So this little backwards e right here means there exists. So this function f, it has an inverse, and basically what that means is that if we give it any x value, it's going to give a y value. So here's an arbitrary x value, and we pass it through our function, and it's going to spit out a y value that's going to be equal to f of x. And similarly, if we give the inverse a y value, it's going to spit out an x value. So we can give it any y value, let's call it this one right here. And we pass it through the inverse function, and it's going to spit out an x value, which is f inverse of y. So that's just a little background on functions and inverses. And let's say that we are interested in the integral of this inverse function, which is a function of y, so we have to integrate with respect to y. And we're going to integrate across some arbitrary interval that we will call c to d. So let's call this point c, and we'll call this point d right here. And these line up with x values that we will call a and b. So graphically, we know that the integral of some function is really just the area under the curve. So this integral right here, the integral from c to d of the inverse function, is actually represented by this area right here. And also, if we were to consider the integral from a to b of the non-inverse, the normal f of x with respect to x, that will give us this area right here. So in this plot that I have right here, the only area that's not shaded is this region right here, this small little rectangle. And by just looking at this picture that I have drawn right here, we can make some very useful observations. So the first is that if I call this area 1 and this area 2, and then this region right here, this golden region, area 3, what I know is that area 1 plus area 2 plus area 3 has to equal b times d, b being the width of this rectangle and d being the total height. And where 1 is this integral right here, and where the area, the green area, number 2, is this integral. And then finally, area 3 is just going to be uh, a times c, this little rectangle right here. So I can actually rewrite that as the integral of f of x dx from a to b, which is area 1, plus the integral of c to d of f inverse of y dy is equal to bd minus this area 3, which is a times c. So graphically, we get this relation between the areas and the integrals. And what's really cool is that we can actually use this relation to solve the integrals of some inverse functions. And we will get to that in just a little bit. Now, as you can see in this form right here, we have limits. So this is not an indefinite integral. This is a definite integral because we're integrating across some interval. And a lot of times that's not what we're interested in. Sometimes we're just, we just want the indefinite integral. And what the first fundamental theorem of calculus tells us is that for some function, the integral of a to b of some arbitrary function that we, that we will call g of t, we can express that as the indefinite integral evaluated at b minus the indefinite integral evaluated at a. So this capital G represents the indefinite integral. And basically what this theorem tells us is that we can use the indefinite integral evaluated at the limits and then we take the difference and that will give us uh, an expression for this. And we can apply that same idea to this form right here. So instead of getting a bd minus ac, what we actually get is an x times y. So this expression actually becomes the integral of f of x dx plus the integral of f inverse of y dy is equal to x times y. And we can see how that's the case because if we look back at our picture right here, 
we have a and b is the limits on the x, and we have c and d is the limits on the y. So when we evaluate x, y at this first point right here, we have a times c, and then we evaluate it again at the second part right here, we get b times d, which is y, we get b, d minus a, c up here. So basically all this, all that I'm showing right here is I am converting this definite form into an indefinite form uh, that we can more readily use. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rewrite this a little bit. I'm gonna express this as the integral of f inverse of y dy is equal to x times y minus the integral of f of x dx. And so we can use this formula in order to evaluate integrals that include inverses. And sometimes it's a lot easier to do than going through the integration by parts. All right, so let's go ahead and work through an example. So let's say that we were given the integral of the natural log of y dy and instead of using integration by parts, which I did in a previous video, you can check that out if you want, um, we're gonna use this formula that we just derived. So let's let f inverse of y equal to our integrand, which is natural log of y. And we know that the natural log of y has an inverse, which is actually f of x is equal to e to the x. And if you guys don't believe me, we can actually prove that. And the reason is because uh, if we consider f of f inverse of y, we get e to the natural log of y, which is equal to just y. And we can also consider f inverse of f of x, which is equal to the natural log of e to the x, which is just x. And this is a valid proof to show that e to the x is in fact the inverse of the natural log of y and vice versa. So anyway, we let the inverse of f equals natural log of y, and we know that f of x, its inverse, is equal to e to the x. So let's go ahead and plug that into our formula. So we get equals x times y minus the integral, and I'm gonna plug in for f of x, which is e to the x dx. So this comes out as x times y minus e to the x. But since we are integrating with respect to y, we want everything in terms of y. So what that means is that we have to change all of our x's into f inverse of y's. And that's just because of this fact right here. We can represent any x value as the inverse. So when we do that, we get this is equal to f inverse of y times y minus e to the f inverse of y. And now we go ahead and plug in for f inverse of y, which is just the natural log of y. So this is equal to the natural log of y times y minus e to the natural log of y. And we can simplify this to y times the natural log of y minus y. So this is our answer. And this is actually the exact same answer that we got when, whenever we did integration by parts. So what's pretty cool about this is that we were able to evaluate this integral, the natural log of y, and all we had to do was integrate e to the x, which is really, really easy. In fact, it's just trivial because e to the x is just e to the x. And in my opinion, that's actually a pretty powerful technique. And you can apply this to other examples as well. Let's say that we wanted to evaluate the integral of sine inverse of y. Uh, so in this case, our f inverse of y is equal to sine inverse of y. And by definition, our f of x is going to equal sine of x. So all we have to do is plug it into our equation. So this is equal to xy minus the integral of f of x, which is sine of x dx. And this is equal to xy plus cosine of x. And then all we have to do is change our x's to f inverse of y's, which is just, in this case, sine inverse of y. And so when we make that substitution, we get sine inverse of y times y plus cosine of sine inverse of y. So instead of using integration by parts, we used this formula and we were able to do that really, really fast. Now, some of you are probably thinking, okay, this isn't really the form that I'm used to seeing this integral as, but it is still valid. Oh yeah, and I also forgot this plus c and I forgot the plus c on the other one. So please forgive me. Anyway, I just wanna show you that really cool technique. In fact, I dare you guys, next time on a test, if you ever see this, this integral or homework, or whatever, or the integral of natural log of x, I dare you guys to use this and give them this answer. I'm actually kind of curious of what your teacher would say if you gave them this as an answer or, or if all you showed was this work. Um, yeah, that'd be kind of funny. So go ahead and do that and report back here. Anyway, 
See you guys later.